Well, we always like, like to, uh, at the beginning of the service, open with Scripture. And today that Scripture is from Psalm uh, 103, verses 11 through 14. Let's read it, all, read it together. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. For far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are dust. This is God's word, and this is what I believe. We're going to sing His Name is Wonderful. Number 24. Your hymn note, number 24. His Name is Wonderful. Let's stand together. We sing. We're going to sing it. Place through. song and we're studying this in Sunday school class if you missed Sunday school class you missed a great message on Revelation and Daniel who describes Jesus Christ in his glorified form that we're going to see for eternity and can you imagine what he looks like well the Bible tells us what he looks like that's what pastor went over this morning so next week we're studying Revelation in Sunday school class please come join us thank you you may be seated pastor For the note takers out there, there are <clears throat> hard copies of today's uh, outline if you want to take notes or on the coffee table back there. So feel free to grab them if you want. And we have one for the kids, and we also have one for the adults. So if you're a note taker, go ahead and grab one of those. You're free to do so. <clears throat> Well, folks, in today's special message, I would like to examine the power, the patience, 
and the priorities of Father as we turn to our biblical text, which is found in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 2, we're going to read verses 22 through 26 and 29 through 31 for our text this morning. And we're going to look at the story of Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. So chapter 2, 1 Samuel, down to verse 22, and the word of God says to us this morning. Now Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons were doing to Israel, and how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. He said to them, Why do you do such things, the evil things that I hear from these people? No, my sons, for the report is not good, which I hear the Lord's people circulating. If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. Now by the boy Samuel, the boy Samuel was growing in stature, and in favor both with the Lord and with men. Now let's jump down to 29. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling, and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choices of every offering of my people Israel? God speaking to Eli. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel declares, I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will break your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. And Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the gift of your eternal word. We thank you for its supernatural power and its ability. We depend upon you now, Holy Spirit, to direct us to your truth and to use this time to your glory, that Jesus Christ will be exalted, that the saints will be built up, and that the church will go forward in its mission in our world. And we thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. The word father in the Hebrew language is the word ab, and of course in the Greek language it is patir, kind of sounds similar. Now that term literally means nourisher and protector, and it actually signifies the office of father. It signifies that office as much as it does the role of the male parent. Now, the definition of nourisher and protector is well detailed in the Word of God, as we're going to see a tremendous amount of power that is vested into the role of the Father. Both in Jewish and Roman culture, the Father of the household was the absolute supreme authority. The head of the home had complete authority over the right of the land, complete authority over judgment, and complete authority in the matters of civil rights. That was the father. The Hebrew father could arrange the marriage of his children, as we see in Genesis chapter 24, demonstrated in Abraham's arrangement of the marriage for his son Isaac. He had the authority to even sell his children, as we see in Exodus chapter 21. He had the power, folks, over life and death. Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21. So the father had a lot of power, a lot of authority. And historically, in the Hebrew culture, because they had the enlightenment of Jehovah, because of that enlightenment, because of the truth of the Word of God and their intimate relationship with the Creator, they were much more compassionate in their family relationships, in their culture, than their pagan counterparts were. History shows us that a Roman father 
would near as often cast out a female baby as to keep it, being that sons were so highly prized back in the day. It kind of reminds me of modern times in the nation of China. They have a zero population growth philosophy there, and so they only want one child per family. That brought about a terrible thing known as window babies. And all the female babies that were born were simply set out in a window to die. Because they only had one child, and everybody wanted a boy to carry on the family name. So we have this even going on to this day. But when we talk about Rome, the Roman Forum did a booming slave trade every night when uh, unwanted children were led out into the forum for auction to be put up for sale. At the zenith of Roman, Roman power, 75% of the empire was slave. Now we talk about today in our modern world, human trafficking. That's a big thing we're hearing about today because it is so prevalent. But human trafficking is nothing more than slavery of children. We are selling our kids across the globe for human trafficking. And slavery today is a thing that is still very prevalent in the Islamic culture of the Middle East. Now when we read about the amazing stories of Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, we see how valuable the blessing of a father was and how anathema the curse of a father could be. Isaac was made a very wealthy man by the blessing of his father Abraham. Jacob so valued Isaac's blessing that upon the coaxing of his mother, he masqueraded as his older brother Esau and stole the ancestral blessing that rightfully belonged to the firstborn. That's how valuable the Father's blessing was. And when we think of the power of the blessing, or the power of the curse of a father in the Old Testament times, we think of Noah. And we think of how in Genesis chapter 19, remember back when they got off the ark? Things had changed on the planet now. And he cultivated the fruit of the vine... And uh, we think, a lot of the commentators believe that in the New World, since that global flood, the properties of wine were not quite yet known because the atmosphere had changed. Noah, in drinking that fermented wine, succumbed to it, and he is found by his son, Ham, in a drunken stupor, nakedness exposed in his tent. Now, Ham made sport of the incident, but the respectful sons, Shem and Japheth, with respect for their father, actually took a blanket and walked backward into the tent to cover their dad. As a result, Shem and Ham were blessed. But Canaan, who was the son of Ham, was dealt an everlasting curse. The curse was slavery. And by the way, who populated the African continent? The son of Noah named Ham. He has been in servitude to his brothers for centuries now. So the Bible lends a tremendous amount of power and authority to the the position of father. But it always should be remembered, folks, that with power comes responsibility. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 and 48, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Both God and man have committed much to Father. And there are great benefits for serving in the position of Father But, of course, with the benefits always come the responsibilities. 
So in our text before us today, we have an example of a man that has been invested with great power, great responsibility, and great authority. Eli was the high priest in Israel. He was also a judge of that nation. So he covered two huge bases there. He covered the spiritual side of the nation, as well as the legal and civil side of the nation. And he was the first man that held both offices simultaneously. And according to the scripture, he discharged his duties faithfully, and he judged Israel for 40 years. To be both the high priest and the judge in a theocratic society meant that he had a lot of power and he had a lot of authority. And not only, of course, was he the judge and the high priest of Israel, but he was also the father of two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Back down to verse 22 through 25. <clears throat> now Eli was very old, and he heard that all that of his sons were doing to all of Israel and how they lay with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things, the evil things that I hear from these people? No, my sons, for the report is not good which I hear the Lord's people now circulating. If one man sins against God, another, one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. Now, as we uh, read this passage, I kind of like to take a detour into our sanctified imaginations, if we may. We can speculate about what went on in that household over the years. We can speculate about how Eli thoroughly occupied with the responsibilities of his dual career, was a very busy man. We can see him busily serving in the tabernacle, and in his, in the, his off moments, he was having to decide cases between feuding, arguing Israelites as the judge. Everyone placed demands upon him, upon his time, upon his ministry, upon his office, and as sometimes happens to men of the cloth, Eli began to get his priorities confused. Wanting to serve the Lord and the people to the best of his abilities, he totally immersed himself into his work. And he failed to realize that even in ministry, career, comes number four on the priority list. It comes behind God, spouse, and children. That's right, even ministry. Now we can imagine, again, in our sanctified imaginations, little Hophni and little Phineas growing up in Eli's household. We can think about the times that those two little boys approached their father with little needs that little boys have and little questions that they would have and unfortunately they were ignored or unanswered because dad was busy. Dad was so busy with the work of the Lord he kind of forgot the Lord of the work. Your first ministry is to your family. How many preachers today have lost their families. One of my favorite preachers back from the 19th century, the Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Amazing genius of a man during the Victorian era, era in uh, London, England. Great a preacher as he was, prolific teacher that he was, he lost his son to the world. How many times haven't we heard that sad story? And from the passage that we're reading today, we see that these two PKs, Hophni and Phinehas as young men, they start to get a very bitter taste in their mouth for the ministry. 
or the priesthood that they were to inherit. They had contempt for the office. Didn't even, probably even personally know the Lord as Savior and God. The God they were supposedly serving. Father Eli did not take the time to instruct his boys in the way of the Lord. He lost his children to sin. And though the man was very successful in his career, he was a tragic failure as a dad. Now, personally, folks, I am not a man of means. I will have nothing, very little, to hand down to my own family once I'm gone. But I will say this, one thing I do have, one thing I did give when I was raising my kids. I gave them, number one, my time, and I gave them my faith. And it's proven today that those are the two most valuable things that you can give your children. Now the bright spot in the whole story that we have before us is seen down in verse 26. Now the boy Samuel was growing in stature and in favor with both the Lord and with man. So you see what happens here is God gave Eli a do-over. He gave Eli a second chance. Even though he totally failed raising his own two boys, the Lord gave Eli, I guess what we might call a consolation prize. When Samuel's mother Hannah dedicated this young little life to temple service. Samuel became a man that was mighty in spirit. He also became the first prophet and the last judge of Israel. Eli got a chance to do it over. But he had the power, he had the authority, he had the responsibility, folks, to train and to teach and to discipline his own children, but he did not. And in the failure of just one father, in the failure of just one generation, the failure to teach and to train that next generation, an entire family line, was lost. Down to 29 once again. God speaking to Eli, Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling? And why do you honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people Israel? Therefore the Lord God of Israel declares, I did indeed say that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord declares, Far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor those who despise me, and I will lightly esteem. And here it is. Behold, the days are coming when I will break your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there, there will not be an old man in your house. <clears throat> now you notice here how in verse 29, Jehovah says, that by not training, that by not disciplining, by not teaching your sons, you put them above me. Priorities out of whack. You see, you were supposed to follow God's command to discipline those little lives to which he has entrusted us. He gives you a child, that is a blessing from the Lord. Children are an inheritance of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward, says Psalm 127. And when God gives us those precious little gifts, we have a duty to train and to teach and to discipline them. And when we don't fulfill that duty, folks, we're placing the children above God. God says, do this. And if you don't do it, you're putting the kids above God. In fact, Ephesians 6, 4, New Testament, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger or wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition 
of the Lord. <clears throat> so it only takes one father. It only takes one leader entrusted with that amazing power as a dad, that amazing responsibility to neglect that responsibility before the family is lost. It only takes one. And you know something? Satan also knows that. The devil knows what it takes to destroy a family. You knock out the head of the household, you knocked out that family. You, or gravely damaged it. Mom and dad are the linchpins in the family, in the household. And the devil knows if he can get either one of them. If he can tempt either one of them. If he can neutralize the work of either one of them, he's got the family. Family is the bedrock of a society. The family in America is being destroyed. It is being ruined. I've often looked at <coughs> children as kind of like a, a blank piece of wood. Beautiful piece of wood that God gives to you. And it's your job now to carve and to form and to make that masterpiece out of that little blank that the Lord has entrusted to you. And so you can either make a masterpiece out of that little block, or you can make firewood fit for the fire. Which are we doing? Are we making God-fearing Christians, or are we making law-breaking criminals? Which are we doing? The Father is given a great responsibility before the Lord. Unfortunately, that office has been compromised in America like never before. You folks, you wonder why we're dealing with a trans issue? You wonder why we're dealing with a LGBTQ plus 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 whatever issue? You wonder why we're dealing with that? Is because of the fatherlessness of America today. I believe fatherlessness is the biggest issue that we are facing today. Dads have that job before the Lord. They have that authority. They have that responsibility before the Lord. To train those children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And that's New Testament. Now we've seen the, the power of the father and his responsibility. I want to look at... <clears throat> Dad's patience. By the way, Dr. Billy Graham said, a good father is the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. And he said that decades ago. Still true today. Now we look at Dad's patience in our fast-paced 21st century lifestyle, folks. It's easy for us to lose our patience. It's easy for us to not do what God has commissioned us to do. We get so involved with the tyranny of the urgent that we ne neglect the time for what is important. So, dads today, we have to have patience to instruct and to train our children now, again, you've probably heard this, but we'll say it again. Dads are the high priest of their household. They are the high priest of their home. Okay? You can be the high priest for the Lord, or you can be the high priest for the devil. Which one do you want to be? We need to be a high priest of our household, representing our kids, representing our families, to the Lord. That's what the priest does. We are to teach and we are to train our children in the priority of the Lord. We are to bring to them the truth of God's word. Now I want to just clue you in on something. If, if you didn't know this, the way children view the father of the household is the way they will view the Heavenly Father. 
You are representing God to those children. In fact, you are God to those children in their little, short little lives. So are you representing the holy, loving, heavenly Father the way he should be represented to those children? Because whatever you do, that's how they're going to view God in heaven. Fathers are instructors. They instruct in vital areas. It should be the spiritual area first and foremost. Dad teaches us many things as we are growing up. The presence of the Father is vital. Dad teaches us how to throw a ball and to catch a ball. Dad teaches us how to ride a bike. Dad teaches us how to bait a hook, how to clean a fish, how to shoot a gun, how to paint a fence, how to mow the lawn. That's Dad's prerogative. And that's what he ought to be doing with those little ones. It's Father who patiently guides his boy in the building of his first woodworking project. It's Father who teaches him the proper use of tools, how to do the basic maintenance on an automobile for which someday he will be responsible. Back in the day, when cars still had points and plugs, my dad taught me how to set the points, how to install the points, how to change the plugs, how to change the wires, how to change alternators, how to change starters, doing all that stuff back when you could still crawl under those vehicles and work on it. Can't do it anymore. Sadly, you got to pay big dollars for the guys that have the right tools. But that's dad's job. At least point them in the right direction. I, I'm thankful my firstborn, he's mechanically inclined. Stuff I couldn't teach him, he picked up on his own because he'd get in there and he would do it. And talking about working on projects together. Uh, <laughs> My kids were involved in the Awana program. I don't know if you're familiar with the Awana program when they were growing up. A-W-A-N-A, -A, approved, approved workmen are not ashamed. So my kids were in the Awana program. One of the big events of the annual Awana program was the Awana Grand Prix. And that's where the dads and the boys got together and they built their little pine cars. Right? You buy the kit and you carve the car out and you make that car, you sand it and you shape it and you paint it and put your decals on it. Then you put in the axle and you put on the plastic wheels. So my oldest son and I were doing the Awana pro project together, and we figured out the secret to winning. You've got to put graphite on that steel, graphite on those wheels. So we'd sit there, put graphite on the wheels, spin those wheels, get them like glass, man. My son won first place. <laughs> the, Awana, the Awana Grand Derby. The Awana Grand Prix. Guess what? Last month, him and his son, Matty, who's nine years old, entered the Iwana Grand Prix down in Houston, Texas, took first place <laughs> in the Iwana Grand Prix. He took first place in speed. He took third place in design. And the Texans didn't like it because my son put, built a car very similar to the one we built. I said, hey, Grant, I said, how'd you win? He said, well, I said, Dad, all night long, I sat there and spun those wheels on that axle with the graphite. <laughs> they didn't like it down in Texas because he put a big... U of M, M on the top of the car. <laughs> and it won. <laughs> but dads, that's the kind of things we can do together to make a memory for our kids, right? It's dad who fixes his daughter's broken doll. It's dad who pushes her on the swing. It's dad who carries her on her back. It's dad who demonstrates the proper tenderness of a man for a girl. I uh, recall back in the day when my kids were little, <clears throat> we would uh, rough house in the living room. And of course, moms don't like that because you bang into the coffee table and you knock stuff down. But we'd bang in, we'd roll around, and you know what? The boys loved it, of course. They loved that stuff. But my little daughter, the youngest, <laughs> she wanted to get in on the action too. And she, I think she benefited as much from rolling around on the living room floor as the boys did. But the girls got to have that same kind of contact. Dobson says so. So don't just take it from Pastor Gould. By the way, if you're rolling around banging the furniture, just say Pastor Gould said it was okay. Okay? 
Well, I recall, folks, back in my own boyhood years, how my dad, who often uh, was gone from home, riding the rails to some distant city, he was a railroad engineer for the Chesapeake in Ohio. So when he did come home, his priority for the family was either to go camping, hunting, or fishing, one of those things. And uh, he wasn't really an, a real patient individual. <laughs> But you could see the best side of my own father when we were out doing something out of doors. That's the best side. And I recall many of the things that he did te teach me how to do as far as woodcraft and those things. And one of them was to how to track a rabbit. We were, he was a hunter. And he taught me some of the basics of tracking. And he said, you got to look for a good skiff of snow, fresh skiff of snow. And we have that in Michigan during the wintertime. And we were in West Michigan at that time, and Dad and I went rabbit hunting. I was 12, and we were out doing our thing out in the field, and we were looking for that proper track, and he was teaching me what the proper track was, what to look for. And on that morning, the, the bunnies had been out all night long romping around. There were tracks in abundance, but we had to find that one special track, that fresh track to follow. Well, we found it, and we followed it for a ways through the woods, and then it came out into an open field, and we followed that single track, and, and out in the center of that open field was a little copse of one-inch saplings, and we followed the track. Dad said, okay, this is what you look for on a fresh track, and keep your eyes ahead of you so that you see if it's out there, you've got to keep looking ahead. Don't be looking at the ground. Look at the track and look ahead. So as we looked ahead in that little copse of trees, there sat the bunny right at the base of the trees. Now, my dad didn't want me to shoot the rabbit just sitting there. I wanted to just shoot that thing. But dad said, no. He says, I want you to walk up there, and I want you to flush that rabbit. So I had my brand new, I got it, brand new Beretta 20-gauge single shot that my dad gave me for my 12th birthday. And I had that single shot, and I was going up there slow, but sure. And as I'm walking up there, at the end of the field, there's a, a two-track road, a little dirt road. And a guy's driving by, and he sees the big drama going out in the field, and he stops. And he gets out of the car, and he goes out there, and he stands there watching, see what's going to happen. Now the pressure's on, man. Pressure's on. My dad's behind me. He says, back me up. But pressure's on. There's a guy in the front, a guy behind me, and there's a rabbit and me in the middle. I'm like, man, i got to do this. <laughs> So I'm, I'm walking up, rabbit flushes straight away from me, fired the gun, number six shot, rolled him in the, in the snow, that was it. The guy up on the road, he's smiling and grinning away, and my dad behind me, man, his buttons were coming off of his chest at that time. He was proud. But see, those are the kind of things that my father related to. And there's nothing more edifying to a father than when his children make him proud. And of course, Proverbs 15, 20, a wise son makes a glad father. So dads, your children will not be wise unless you are patient enough to teach them. John Eldridge in his book, Wild at Heart, says the, that boys have to be commissioned into manhood. And only a father can do that. Mom can't do it. Dad has to do it. So dads, my exhortation to you out there today is to build us some men. Build us some men. We need men in America today. Sometimes dad's tendency is to be a little bit aloof. Sometimes dads tend to be untouchable. They run their families oftentimes like they do their businesses. But dads, we have to learn how to show affection to the kids. We have to show them the affection to their mothers. We have to show them what a proper relationship in a marriage is supposed to look like. And we are supposed to be examples of Christ-like love. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. 
and gave himself for it. So that's a sacrificial kind of love. We are to exemplify that. We are to be patient to teach that. And as we read our text once again, we see that Eli fell short on the example part. He fell short on the discipline side of child rearing. And he did break the precept of Proverbs 22.15 that says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Eli must have been negligent on the discipline. He must have fallen short on that discipline side. And remember, the Lord said, you preferred your kids above me. You did not discipline them as the way I wanted you to discipline and to train them. You did not apply the board of education to the seat of learning. As is often said, we should. So dads, we have that responsibility. Don't leave it to mom to do all the time. I know when you get home from work and mom says, wait till your dad gets home. You get home from work, the last thing you want to do is have to discipline the kids. But you got to do it. Mom can't be the one to do it all the time. You got to do it. When it comes from dad, then it really means something. So dads have that responsibility as much as sometimes we don't like it. So we lead our homes not as an iron-fisted dictator, but we lead it the same way Jesus Christ leads the church, that is, with holiness, but with firmness. With love, but firmness. And dad, I'll, dads, I'll say, uh, it's a whole lot easier just to go with the flow. A whole lot easier not to do what God has called us to do. Very easy to take the, the easy way out. It's very easy not to take charge. It's very easy not to lead. But we are called to be the leaders of our home. And let me say this to you. If you do not lead your home, somebody else will. And it might not be your wife. The school would love to lead your home. The government would love to lead your home. If you do not take charge of your home, somebody else will. And Satan is always standing there at the door, ready to step in. You drop the slack, Satan will pick it up. The Bible tells us, Ephesians 4.27, do not give place to the devil. You give him place, he'll take it. Do, let, do not let the devil take your home. Too many have done that. And obviously with a 50% divorce rate going on today, nobody's there protecting that family like it should be. Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You know, there's a lot of ways that we can provoke our kids to wrath. We can provoke our kids to wrath by showing favoritism. Eli provoked his children to wrath by overindulgence. We can provoke our kids to wrath by neglect, by lack of discipline like I just mentioned. He didn't have enough compassion and patience for his own children to train them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And he's the priest of Israel. So finally, let's look at Father's priorities. The best list of priorities I have seen, uh, we just kind of went over them a little bit earlier, but they are in a descending order. Beginning at the top, number one priority, God. In descending order. Next priority, spouse. Next priority, children. Number three. And at a distant fourth, it is the career. God, spouse, children, career. You get those out of sequence, you get those out of order, and suddenly everything goes awry. I picked up a little track called uh, uh, Checklist, 
for fathers, checklist for fathers sometime back, contained some interesting quotes from dads who were asked questions. Number one, if your children were small again, what would you do differently? First man said, I would love the mother of my children more. That is, I would be more free to let my children see that I love her. Among other things, I would praise her in the presence of my children so that they would see this. Second man said, I would listen more. I would try to refrain from words of impatience at interruptions. Such times can be the best times to show love and tenderness. I would try to understand what my child says because I now believe that the father who listens to his child when he is small will find that he will have a child who listens to him through the rest of his life. It's estimated that a child will have asked approximately 500,000 questions by the time he's age 15. So the privilege to teach is given to every parent. Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7. These commandments are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. You're supposed to talk about these things all the time with your kids. Third father said, I would seek more opportunities to give my child a feeling of belonging. A fourth father said, I would express words of appreciation and praise more. Probably no other thing encourages a child to confidence and to accomplishment than the praise of a parent. I can I'll tell you this from experience, and I've seen it over my years of ministry. Dad's approval is more precious than gold. A fifth dad said, if I were to start my family again, I would laugh more. I know when I laughed with my children, our love was enlarged, and the door was opened for doing many other things with them together. Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. A sixth father said, I would spend more time together. A group of 300 seventh and eighth grade boys kept accurate records of how much time their fathers actually spent with them over a two-week period. Most saw their father only at the dinner table, if then. It was found that the average time a father and son were together for an entire week was seven and a half minutes. So Eli was one of the minute-a-day fathers, and it cost him not only his two sons, but it cost him an entire family line. So after all, dads, isn't it? Love for our kids... And isn't that love for our kids spelled T-I-M-E? A young successful attorney told of a Christmas present that he received from his dad one year. It was a simple box with a note in it that read, Son, this year, I'm giving you 365 hours of my time. Every day after supper, we will spend one hour together talking about the things you want to talk about, doing the things that you want to do. The young attorney said, My dad not only kept his promise, but every year he renewed it. And it's the greatest gift I ever had in my entire life. I am a result of his time. 
So not only should we spend time with our kids, but we should spend time praying with our kids. Because face it, guys, most of us here are really not going to have much to give to our kids. When we pass on, and the only thing that we have is T-I-M-E, but that has to be invested now. It's the most valuable thing that we can give our children. To you, O oh son of mine, I cannot, cannot give a vast estate of wide, fertile lands, but I can keep for you, whilst I live, unstained hands. I have no blazoned scutcheon that ensures your path to eminence and worldly fame, but longer than worldly her heraldry endures a blameless name. I have no treasure chest of gold refined, no hoarded wealth of clunking, glittering pelf. I give you my hand and heart and mind, all of myself. I can exert no mighty influence to make a place for you in men's affairs, but lift to God in secret audience, unceasing prayer. I cannot, though I would, be always near to guard your steps with the parental rod. I trust your soul to him who holds you dear. I trust you to your Father God. Amen. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. And even now, as fathers, we realize the important position that you have given to us in the training and the admonition of the next generation. Heavenly Father, the great Father of heaven, we pray that you would forgive us of where we have failed. Cleanse us of our own self-righteousness, our own selfishness, our own desires, and help us to have the desires of God. Help us to be stewards of those little lives that you've entrusted to us. Help us to create the masterpiece that you place in our hands. And that will be done only through the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Help us to be godly men. Help us to be faithful men. Help us to be men who understand our power, our patience, and our priorities. Help us as men. Help us as husbands, as fathers. As heads of our household, empower us by the strength of your spirit. It's nothing we can do on our own, but it is something we must choose to do. Now for all the dads here today, would any of them say, Pastor Gould, pray for me that I could be a better dad. If that's your desire, slip your hand up. I will pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you all around. If you do not know the Lord as your Savior, and you're saying, Pastor Gould, pray for me that I could know Jesus Christ personally and have the power of Christ to lead my household, whether you're male or female. Pastor, pray for me that I could know Christ personally today. If that's your desire, slip up your hand. I will pray for you. This is our invitation. And Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the men that are here present today that have felt it important to be in the house of the Lord. We thank you for these men, and these men know their need. And certainly you are the God who meets the needs of men. We depend upon you to strengthen us and to fill us with your spirit. We depend upon you to give us the wisdom that we need as men to lead our homes, to lead our families, and yes, to lead our nation. Give us that wisdom. Give us that power. Give us that faith. Give us that love, Lord. We depend upon you now, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.